Great. Well, um, glad to be here. My name is Zach Easton. I'm a hydrologist uh, watershed model modeler in the Department of Biological System Engineering at Virginia Tech. And I'll talk a little bit about the tool that we developed today. It's, it's, it's similar in application to the one Tony just presented. It uses a little bit different uh, methodology to get at sort of the same uh, watershed to field level scale predictions of saturated and contributing areas across a watershed. Um, and so I would start by saying this tool emphasizes trying to get at the at two of the four R's in, in nutrient management, the right time and the right place. So we're trying to be able to predict uh, the extent of saturated runoff producing areas in time and space so we can uh, direct nutrient management at those scales. And we do have a paper that just came out in environmental modeling and software that details uh, this specific model. And so what are we trying to do here? Well, Tony talked about this a little bit, but we're looking at uh, trying to um, protect saturated areas from uh, excessive nutrient loss um, in these watersheds. And it's based on the, on the theory of variable source area hydrology, which plays a major role in runoff and pollutant transport um, in many of these uh, temperate, humid, um, mountainous watersheds of the East Coast. And so what is this? Is it saturation excess uh, rainfall falling on a saturated area um, that creates these flow paths, which again, Tony just showed very nicely, but we create these flow paths here from pollutant sources to ditches or streams, and that's where we get the bulk of our nutrient loss in some of these watersheds. And so what we're trying to do is identify these short-term high-risk areas so that we can actually increase the flexibility, nutrient management flexibility for producers. So if they know that, uh, you know, four days in the future, you know, a rainfall event is going to saturate these two areas of, of their field. Well, we're not going to apply manure there. Perhaps we can either move to a different field that isn't saturated or maybe do some operations here, although that might still be risky given the spatial extent of it. So really we're trying to provide sub-field scale, short-term distributed predictions to inform these nutrient management decisions. And so the, the test bed or the study area we're working in is the South Fork of the Shenandoah River watershed. It's located uh, mainly in Virginia, but a small portion in West Virginia, in the Shenandoah um, Valley of Virginia. And it's been identified by the Environmental Protection Agency as a critical nitrogen and phosphorus source area to Chesapeake Bay. And the Chesapeake Bay right now is subject to the largest and most expensive uh, TMDL ever developed. So there's real pressure on these big agricultural centers to reduce their contribution to the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it, it's an interesting watershed. Uh, there's not much row crop in it. It's about 40% agriculture. It's mainly pasture, but there's a tremendous amount of poultry and livestock production in this watershed. So a lot of manure produced in this watershed. And here's sort of a, just a Google screenshot of what uh, the watershed looks like aerially. So we, we're, we're surrounded by the mountains on both the east and west. And then this uh, long valley here is almost entirely agriculture. And there's a picture from the ground. It's a really pretty area. Um, a lot of really good fishing streams in this area that people want to try and protect as well. So there's a lot of uh, you know, uh, friends of the Shenandoah River have a, have a big operation there, a lot of different NGOs uh, trying to protect these systems. So I'm going to focus a little bit on how we developed this modeling system and some of the results that we were able to produce uh, using a system. And so this just shows an overview of what our framework, the forecast system framework looks like. And I'll step through sort of each of these four um, components briefly. But basically we have uh, a component that collects the data we need to run our model. That's de uh, delivered to the physical model that we developed to predict the extent of saturated areas and runoff generating areas in the watershed. And then we have a data processing step that takes the data from the model and turns it into something useful for the end user. Um, and then we have the hosting, which is the actual web-based interface that displays the, the forecast for the end user. So the, fir the first step, so the remote data service. So this really contains two components. We've got the meteorological data gathering, which has to be automatic. So what we do is we collect a hindcast and a live forecast from the NOAA um, global forecast system model output statistic uh, model. So they provide um, a forecast every six hours for up to at least 16 days. We found we can only go about four days out in terms of accuracy. But that had to be automated because we need to collect that data in real time four times a day and get it into our model. So that's an automated component that's done in the R software. Then there's sort of a static component, the spatial data that we need to run the model. 
doesn't really change. You know, land use, you know, over the course of a year or two doesn't change. Elevation doesn't change. Um, soil type doesn't change. So those can be gathered by hand and, and, and piped into the model. Then we have the, the forecasting system framework. So this is sort of what I would call the, the brains behind the forecast. So we take that um, static land use, soil, and elevation data, and then the dynamic or the, the daily forecast data, weather forecast data, and bring that into our, our modeling framework. We use uh, a derivative of the SWAT model called SWAT VSA, so SWAT Variable Source Area Model. And what the model does is it uses a terrain metric, similar to what Tony showed, to predict water movement and then where saturated areas form across the landscape. I won't go into real detail about it, but I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And then what this does is it, is it produces a, a spatial prediction across this south fork of the Shenandoah watershed, a three meter, three meter uh, square pixel or, or, or raster output. So we have a, a spatially explicit map of, say, a soil moisture content for every three meter square in the watershed. And that's what we're going to show for the model output. So this is what our terrain um, map or model looks like that we use to drive um, water movement across the watershed. And, and without going into detail, basically, these blue areas are areas that are much more likely to be saturated and produce runoff, whereas these red areas are much less likely to be saturated and produce runoff. And it's similar to Tony's. These Saturated areas tend to be near these in these near stream areas, or in some cases, areas where there's really shallow soil um, or really shallow slopes where water can't get out of that soil profile, so it tends to saturate. And so I'll just show a couple predictions from the actual model before we go into the data processing and, and visualization component. I'm showing the, the stream flow forecast at the outlet of the Shenandoah River watershed. And now you don't see this in the actual visualization component, but it's critical because this is how we kind of back out the saturated area of the watershed. So if we know how much water is leaving, we know how much water fell on the water on the watershed, rainfall, but we know how much water is leaving the watershed. Well, the, the difference is essentially the, the amount of water that's left in the watershed. So we can um, essentially calculate how much saturation there can be. It's very similar to what, what Tony showed, just use a little bit different metric. And so, so how do we get at that distributed forecast? So again, we're interested in predicting, you know, the extent of saturated areas at a subfield scale. And so we had to develop some sort of a metric to be able to predict that subfield component. So what we said is that soil moisture depth changes with every, for every day of the model. We'll say day, it's really every six hours of the model. Um, the soil moisture can change based on that, that forecast rainfall input, evapotranspiration, drainage out of the soil profile, et cetera. And the model really predicts all that. Um, and so what we used is we used the soil depth as sort of a, a, a means to distribute that soil moisture um, across that watershed. And what we said is that, is that when the soil profile is 80% saturated, so 80% of that soil has soil water in it, then that area is saturated. And we created basically an index of saturation across this watershed. And this shows it a little bit more explicitly spatially. So again, saturation varies spatially across the watershed and through time. And so we have a grid for every, in this case, six hours from the model that says, is that, is that cell saturated? It's either yes or no, whether it's above 80% or not. And then we overlay that on our sort of spatial index, which is based on that uh, terrain metric and then also land use and soil characteristics. So for instance, Cell number one here might be um, a wetness class from that terrain model of two corn on soil type B, and we know it's not saturated. Wetness class or index three might be wetness class 10 on pasture on soil type D, and we know it is saturated. So we have a, a way to, to map the saturation extent across the watershed, and then we overlay that saturated map on a on a um, on a on a essentially Google, Google map for, for visualization. And so, so that's the modeling component. Then, then there's a data processing component. So this is the really expensive computational step. So if we um, made the end user's web browser try to do this, you would basically be able to zoom to maybe a, a, you know, a two by two kilometer square resolution. You couldn't get down to the, 
that subfield resolution. So what we do is we host the data processing on our own server, and we convert that map from the raster map from the model into a web-friendly data structure. So it basically creates, in this case, uh, I think it's 600,000 individual map tiles we create on our server and organizes them um, for overlay in, in the output inter interface, or the visualization component. So all of the computational burden is, is on our server. The end user doesn't have to worry about that. And this is what it looks like. So we have that, again, that output raster of saturated extent, and then we convert that into a file tree of uh, server-ready map grid tiles. And finally, here's the forecasting system framework. This is just our hosting. This presents those tiles to the user as an overlay map. And so it quickly retrieves the user request. The user can zoom down to the field scale, and I'll show that briefly in a second, um, and, get their, and get their image really quickly. And it provides a number of different viewing options. So similar to Tony, we went through some effort to, to sort of verify that our model was correctly um, predicting the extent of the saturated areas. Now, don't worry too much about what's going on here. Just note that, that black is good, and black means that we correctly predicted that a field or part of a field was saturated. Open means that we didn't predict it quickly. So this is from five different dates where we went out and measured saturated areas across the watershed. And out of 50 fields, we correctly predicted the saturated content with the model about 88% of the time, so relatively good um, performance. And so just real quickly, this is um, sort of what the interface looks like. I went this morning and grabbed um, what the predicted saturated extent area is in the Shenandoah uh, for tomorrow. It's a relatively simple interface, not a lot going on, uh, which makes it really mobile friendly as well. There aren't a lot of um, things that have to occur on your phone for this to display. And so that's sort of what the interface looks like. It's got a, it's got a, a, a zoom bar and a transparency bar, scales, and then you can select different forecast hours as well, which I'm going to show you here. And this is sort of an example of the intended, intended use for the system. So again, I zoomed in here to, to a little larger than field scale just to give you some perspective. And I showed um, forecasts for the next 96 hours, starting with, with this uh, image here, A, that's a 24-hour forecast. And here you can see this area is predicted to be entirely saturated, this field. Um, so if you're a producer, you would not want to apply manure, say, today on that field if you're going to have a big event tomorrow. Again, at 48 hours, it's still saturated. Um, at 72 hours, it's starting to dry out. So maybe now you start thinking about when can I apply manure there. And, and if you went out to the 40 forecast, you can see the models predicting that area to be uh, relatively um, saturation free. So if you were planning manure application, perhaps you'd wait those four days and apply it there, or perhaps uh, on perhaps the 48 or, or 24 or 48 hour one, apply it to a different field that's not saturated. You can see some of these fields over here aren't really saturated. Um, and I just added this real quick. This isn't in the, in the one I submitted. Since people were talking about mobile-friendly applications, we did an analysis of several different of these decision support tools. Um, three of them we talked about here, Wisconsin, Washington, and then our model, um, looking at how either desktop or mobile-friendly they were. It turns out a lot of these other ones, these aren't necessarily water resource ones up top here, but most of them aren't mobile-friendly. That's because they rely on a lot of proprietary um, software or they need to download and install a plugin. Um, so the ones that are relatively simple, so uh, Washington's is simple, ours is pretty simple, tend to be pretty mobile friendly, which could, it, could enhance their, their use across the different uh, producer spectrums. So finally, um, we were able to predict, uh, correctly predict the saturated extent 86% of the time for 50 fields. And we feel that producers can use this to really alter the timing and location of nutrient application which I would argue can increase management flexibility. It's not going to kind of, um, call, you know, they, they won't have to um, decrease their, their manure applications if they do it following tools like these. 